Are you ready? Well then, I'm teacher Tiffany. Let's jump right in. The very first English expression you must know is to catch up with, to catch up with. Now, as you listen to the story, see if you can guess the meaning of the expression to catch up with. It was their high school reunion. It had been 20 years since the last time they spent time together and they were excited to see each other, talk about their families, take pictures and catch up with each other. They were having a wonderful time reminiscing about high school and talking about everything that had happened over the last 20 years. They were catching up with each other, but in the midst of their conversations, Barbara, one of the friends said, Hey guys, have you all heard from Brian? And they all said, man, no, we haven't heard from Brian in years either. And Barbara said, man, I would love to catch up with Brian. When we were in high school, we always hung out with each other, but I haven't been able to get in contact with him for years. And as Barbara was speaking, guess who walked up behind her? Brian. Brian tapped her on the shoulder and said, Hey, Barbara, how you doing? Barbara screamed, Brian, you're here. And she gave him a big hug. And he said, you know, Barbara, I'm looking forward to catching up with you as well. Do you know the meaning? Could you guess the meaning of the expression to catch up with? Well, let me tell you the meaning. So the expression to catch up with, it means to speak to someone whom one has not seen for some time or for a long time in order to find out what they've been doing. Just like Barbara in the story missed speaking to Brian. She wanted to catch up with Brian to find out what he had been doing over the last 20 years. Makes sense, right? Now, let me give you some example sentences that will help you use this in real life. Sentence number one, it's always great to catch up with old friends, just like the high school friends were catching up with each other during their reunion. So again, it's always great to catch up with old friends. Next, Samantha left to go catch up with some old friends from college. She wanted to catch up with her friends to find out what they had been doing. And finally, the third one, high school reunions, like our story are great ways for old friends and classmates to catch up with each other. All right. So it makes sense. You can now use this expression to catch up with very good. Now the next expression is also very important. The next expression is to get ripped off by to get ripped off by. Now, as you listen to the story, see if you again can guess the meaning of the expression to get ripped off by it was their very first date. They were excited to be going out to a restaurant together and she was holding her flowers excited because she had liked him for a long time and he was looking forward to taking her to his favorite restaurant. So they finally arrived and he, he took her purse and he took the flowers and said, Hey, I, I'll let you sit down first. And he let her sit down and <coughs> he cleared his throat and said, um, <coughs> uh, I really have liked you for a long time. And she said, I've liked you too. And they proceeded to talk for a long time after they ordered their food and they were having a wonderful time together. The food came and she enjoyed her meal and he enjoyed his meal. But then the bill came. Now it was his favorite restaurant. So he knew the majority of the prices, but when the waiter brought the bill, he looked at it and something was wrong. He didn't want to reveal that the bill looked a little bit off. It didn't look correct, but he knew something was wrong and he looked at the waiter and the waiter kind of had a smirk on his face. He said, this is your bill, sir. But the young man, he didn't want to be embarrassed in front of the young lady he had invited out to dinner. So he took out his card and he gave it to the waiter and the waiter said, thank you. 
The waiter took the bill back with his card and uh, wrung his card and swiped his card. And then he brought it back to the young man and said, thank you, sir. So the young man put his card back in his wallet, but the, the young girl could tell something was wrong. And she said, are, are you okay? He said, I I'm fine. Let's just go. So she picked up her flowers. She picked up her purse and she followed him outside of the restaurant and they went to find their bikes. And she said, something is wrong. He said, I just got ripped off. She said, what do you mean? The, the food was great. I don't understand. He said, I just got ripped off. The waiter charged me much more than was on than what was on the menu. She said, really? Why didn't you say anything? He said, well, honestly, I, I didn't want to cause a scene or make a scene in the restaurant, but I know he charged me more than I should have been charged. And I really got ripped off. And the young lady said, listen, the meal was great. The company was great but I don't like that you got ripped off. Let's walk back in the restaurant and talk to the manager. And the young man looked at her and said, you'd be okay with that. She said, listen, you're a great guy. You don't deserve to get ripped off. And he smiled and said, man, I like you even more. And they walked back into the restaurant and spoke with the manager and told the manager that they had gotten ripped off and the manager took care of everything. Do you know the meaning of the expression? <laughs> Come on, get ripped off. You got it. Now the expression get ripped off. It means to cheat someone by charging them too much for something. Just like the waiter charged the young man more than he should have been charged. Again, in English, we say to get ripped off by. So to cheat someone by charging them too much. Now I want to give you some example sentences using this expression. Here we go. The first example sentence, the man at the kiosk ripped me off by charging me too much for something that broke so easily. Sentence number two, the restaurant is a ripoff because it's price is over the moon with mediocre taste. The food's not even that good. Now sentence number three, Concession stands are a huge ripoff due to the quality of food and snacks you could get for the same price elsewhere. Again, in English, we say to get ripped off by. So it makes sense, right? Now we're going to move on to our third expression, but I want to let you know something. If you're enjoying this lesson, if you're enjoying the stories that go along with the expressions, you'll really like my English vocabulary with Tiffany channel. That's right. Every single day of the week, except for Saturday, I teach an English lesson. I tell stories and I also help you understand how to pronounce the English vocabulary words. So if you want to improve your English vocabulary and learn a new word every day, go to English vocabulary with Tiffany or hit the link in the description and you can watch new videos every single day. So let's keep moving on to expression number three. Now the third expression is to go for a ride, to go for a ride. Now, as you listen to the story, once again, see if you can guess the meaning of this expression. They had been together for almost 40 years. They were high school sweethearts and they loved being together. And today they were going for a ride just like they did every Sunday at 9 AM. They would go for a ride down their favorite road and they look at the countryside and they see the animals and they would just talk about their life together. But today was just a little bit different. You see a few weeks prior, they had found out that the wife, had dementia. So in a few short months, she would start forgetting things, but her husband did not want her to forget about their Sunday rides. So he said, baby, listen, I know we got some bad news and I know in a few months things are going to change, but do you want to go for a ride? Do you want to go for a ride and see some new things and have our conversations like we used to? And she said, baby, yes, let's go for a ride. So they went out to the car, got in, and they went for their ride. Do you know the meaning? You know it exactly. So 
Here's the definition of the expression to go for a ride. It literally just means to go for a brief leisurely outing as in a car or a motorcycle. Again, just a brief ride, just like the older couple wanted to go out and look at the countryside like they did every Sunday at 9 a.m. Again, in English, we say to go for a ride, a brief, leisurely, relaxing outing in a car or on a motorcycle. Now, let me give you some example sentences to help you use this in real life. Jenny just got a new car for her birthday. So I think we're going to go for a ride after school. Think about how exciting it would be to go for a ride after school in your friend's new car. Jenny just got a new car for her birthday. So I think we're going to go for a ride after school. Here's the second example sentence. My parents and I got into an argument. So I left for a ride to cool off. This individual was angry with his or her parents. So he or she needed to go for a ride, take a leisurely ride in his or her car to relax or cool off. In English, we say go for a ride. And third, on Sundays, like the couple, I like to go for a ride on my bike around town. Again, on Sundays, I like to go for a ride on my bike around town. Makes sense, right? The third expression, again, a commonly used expression to go for a ride. All right, now let's move on to expression number four. This expression you must also know. The fourth expression is to fall apart, to fall apart. Now, as you listen to this story, try to guess the meaning of the expression to fall apart. It was a Friday afternoon and Caroline was sitting with her friends, telling them what had happened between her and Mark. You see, Caroline and Mark had been together for a long time. They had been high school sweethearts and now they were in college. But Caroline said that her and Mike, her and Mark were breaking up and she totally fell apart. She loved Mark. She didn't want to break up with Mark, but unfortunately things just weren't working out. And her friends were standing around her trying to encourage her saying that, listen, you are an amazing person, Caroline. Don't worry. You'll find another guy. But as Caroline was falling apart and, and crying and saying how much she loved Mark, her phone rang. As she picked up the phone, she looked and she saw that it was Mark. She said, hello sniffling. Mark said, Caroline, are you okay? She said, I'm fine, Mark. How are you? He said, Caroline, I've been falling apart all day. I miss you so much. Can we please work this out? And suddenly a smile came across Caroline's face. She said, Mark, I love you too. Let's work it out. And she hung up the phone and suddenly another smile came across her face and she told her friends, Thank you so much for your comfort, but we're going to work it out. She wasn't falling apart anymore. Did you guess the meaning? I think you did. Now falling apart to fall apart just means to lose one's capacity to cope. All of a sudden, as Caroline was telling the story, she started crying and talking about what was happening between her and Mark. She fell apart. She couldn't cope with the sadness anymore. In English, we say to fall apart. So let me give you a few example sentences. Here we go. The first one, knowing how the groom is, their marriage is likely to fall apart. Again, they're not going to be able to cope. They're both going to quit again. One more time, knowing how the groom is, their marriage is likely to fall apart. Sentence number two, I was really close with my dad. And I started to fall apart after his death. I couldn't cope with life. I was crying. I was distraught. I couldn't cope. I started to fall apart after his death. And number three, I was really falling apart during the breakup between my fiance and me, similar to Caroline and Mark's situation before they decided to come back together again. 
I was really falling apart during the breakup between my fiance and me. Makes sense, right? In English, we say to fall apart. Now, one more English expression that you must know. The fifth English expression that you must know in order to sound like a native English speaker is in denial, in denial. Now, as you listen to this story, just like the previous stories, I want you to try to guess the meaning of this expression in denial. He was leaving the office. He had been working there for about 10 years and he thought he was the best employee they ever had. He was kind of arrogant and so many of the employees didn't like him. So when he got the call from his manager telling him that he was fired, he could not believe it. He was completely in denial as he packed his bags and put his boxes together. You have got to be kidding me. They're firing me? No, I'm the best employee they've ever had. And as he was walking out the door, he was still in denial. He said, this has to be a joke. Look at all these employees. None of them are better than me. I am the best employee they've ever had. I know they're going to call me back tomorrow and say, oh, we're so sorry, Scott, please come back. This man was in denial. He could not believe that they would even think about firing him. Do you know the meaning? I think you got it. All right. In denial, another expression you need to know in denial means refusing to admit the truth or reality of something unpleasant. He got fired, but he didn't want to believe. He didn't want to understand the truth of the situation that he was being let go. He was in denial, refusing to admit the truth. So let me give you some example sentences for this expression. The first one, the patient came in to see the results and was immediately in denial. Couldn't believe what the doctor said. Number two, ever since the breakup, she's been in denial and sentence number three. My parents are in denial and they still make breakfast for my brother who recently passed away. They refuse to admit the truth that my brother is no longer alive. In English, we say in denial. Now, before we jump into the lesson, I need to remind you, if your goal is to go from the intermediate level to the advanced English level, you need to go to www.dailyenglishlessons.com. If you want to speak English with confidence, if you want to follow a plan, a proven plan that will help you achieve your English goals, all you have to do is go to www.dailyenglishlessons.com or hit the link in the description. I have created and prepared lessons specifically for you to help you achieve your goal and finally speak English with confidence. So go to www.dailyenglishlessons.com. Now, are you ready? Well then, I'm teacher Tiffany. Let's jump right in. All right, our first expression is to lose track of, to lose track of. Now this expression just means to fail to stay fully aware or informed about. So basically at one time you were very aware of something, you knew what was going on, but then as time went on, you started focusing on other things and you lost track of something. You no longer know a lot about it. So here's the first example sentence. I lose track of my wallet all the time. In the beginning, I know where my wallet is, but then as time goes on, I forget where it is. I lose track of my wallet all the time. Next, we have this example sentence. I lost track of time. And before I knew it, it was 1 AM. I knew what time it was, but then I got busy doing something else and I lost track of time. Makes sense, right? All right, here's the other example sentence. I keep my important documents in a safe so I don't lose track of them. I always know where they are. So again, I keep my important documents in a safe so I don't lose track of them. 
you see how useful this expression is, right? Literally, we use this expression all the time. You'll hear native English speakers, Americans saying this all the time. Shoot, I lost track of time. I need to go. I'm late for my meeting. Shoot, I lost track of time, dot, dot, dot. So you can start using this expression today as well to sound more like a native English speaker. Now, the second expression is another good one to have a taste for again, to have a taste for now, this just means to acquire a preference for something again, to acquire a preference for something. Let me give you an example. I love Indian food and you know that, right? I've talked about it many times. There's a really good Indian restaurant in Columbia, Maryland. It's called Chutneys. If you live in Maryland, you have to visit it. Chutneys. Now I remember the very first time I went to Chutneys, some other friends had recommended the restaurant because they knew that I love Indian food. So I went to the restaurant and I remember the first bite. Whoa! The curry was amazing. So the food was so good. I found myself craving it. So I would call my friends sometimes and say, Hey, I have a taste for Indian food. Do you want to go to Chutney's again? I acquired a taste for their food. I prefer their Indian food to have a taste for makes sense, right? Ooh, mm, I want to eat a certain thing. I've acquired a preference for something. I prefer their Indian food. Here we go. An example sentence. She has a taste for more power. It's not always food. Now that she has become the head manager, she became the manager and all of a sudden, oh, 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 she had this power. She acquired a preference for that feeling of power. So again, she has a taste for more power. Now that she has become the head manager. Next example sentence. I have a taste for cold drinks on hot days. Woo. Man, when it's hot outside and I'm sweating, I really prefer cold drinks. I have a taste for cold drinks on hot days. And what about this example sentence? I have a taste for traveling <laughs> first class. Again, I prefer being in the nicer seats, having the better service. I have a taste for traveling first class. Maybe you have a taste for traveling first class. All right. So now we understand to have a taste for, and you can use it today. Now the third expression is also a really good one. The third expression is to sort out, to sort out. And it just means to resolve a problem. There's a problem and we need to resolve it. We need to fix it. We need to figure out what the issue is. So I remember a friend and I, we had a, a disagreement and we were not speaking to each other for quite a while. And I realized, Hey, there's a problem here. I've been friends with her for a long time and I don't want to lose this friendship. So, Hey, we need to sort out this issue. We need to resolve the problem because this friendship is important. So we sorted it out. And we're friends to this day. We had to resolve the issue, resolve the problem. So let me give you some example sentences that will help you. Here's the first one. I need to sort out my finances. You see how we can use this expression in many different situations. My finances are, are a mess. They're not organized. Hey, I, I need to sort out my finances. I need to get them organized and to resolve the issues I'm having. Next, Philip needs to sort out his travel plans before it's too late. Listen, Philip, there's a problem with your travel plans. Something's not right. You need to sort out your travel plans, resolve the issue. It's starting to make sense, right? A very useful expression. And the third example is she left the country without sorting out her responsibilities. Again, she left the country without sorting out her responsibilities. Well, listen, you have responsibilities. There are problems right now because you are the one in charge. You can't just leave. She said, 
I'm gone. She did not resolve the problems. Again, she left the country without sorting out her responsibilities. Now, the fourth expression is also another good one behind somebody's back again, behind somebody's back. Now, this is a very commonly used expression. It literally means without a person's knowledge in a dishonorable way, without a person's knowledge. Now you may find it tricky to pronounce the first part behind. Now, if you want help with your pronunciation, again, you can get my app English with Tiffany. The link is in the description, or you can go to your cell phone and you can find English with Tiffany in the app store. You'll find pronunciation lessons to help you sound more like a native English speaker. So behind somebody's back without a person's knowledge and usually in a dishonorable way, making them look bad. Ooh, I heard that Samantha told the teacher what Sarah did. She did it behind her back. Sarah didn't know. So again, behind somebody's back, let me give you an example sentence. Dennis went behind Bridget's back and texted his ex-girlfriend. Again, think about it. You can't see behind you, right? So someone is doing something without your knowledge. And usually it's a negative thing. Actually, always it's a negative thing. So Dennis went behind Bridget's back and he texted his ex-girlfriend. Well, he knew Bridget would have been extremely upset. So he did it without her knowledge behind Bridget's back. Now, what about this example sentence in the future? Please don't go behind my back. If you need something, just come to me. Don't go to someone else behind my back without my knowledge, making me look bad. Again, this expression, I need you to try to understand it. And I want you to use it because this expression, we use it all the time. Now here's the third example sentence. Claire went behind Amy's back and spoke to HR directly. Now imagine Amy was probably her boss and Claire should have went to her boss first, or maybe Amy was her coworker that she had an issue with. And instead of speaking to Amy directly, she went to HR human resources. So again, the sentence says Claire went behind Amy's back and spoke to HR directly. You see what's happening, right? So our fourth expression behind somebody's back. Now our fifth expression is another good one. The fifth expression is to look up to somebody again, to look up to somebody. Now this just means to admire and respect someone again, to admire and respect someone. For example, yesterday, true story. I went to my niece's, um, basketball practice slash clinic. She was learning some basketball drills and I was watching her. Now, many people learning how to play basketball, look up to NBA players. She loves to watch Curry. Curry has that nice three point shot. He, she loves the way he dribbles. She looks up to Curry. She looks up to him because he plays very well. Now check out this example sentence. Kai looks up to his older brother, Noah. Kai really admires his older brother. Next we have the other teachers really look up to her. They really admire her. They look up to her. And finally, I tend to look up to successful people again, admire and respect them. You see, this expression is very easy. You can use it right now. Who do you look up to? You know what? Actually in the comment section, let us know who do you look up to? Let us know that person's name and maybe why you look up to that individual. The first English expression is to look down on somebody. Good job again after me to look down on somebody. Excellent. Last time to look down on somebody. 
Great job. Now I'm helping you with your English pronunciation, but if you want to learn even more about English pronunciation and English in general, you can download my app English with Tiffany. The link is right in the description. Now, what does this expression mean? It means to think of or treat someone or something. We normally speak about someone as unimportant or unworthy of respect. Think about middle school students. Sometimes they don't respect their teachers. Sometimes they think that their teachers don't know anything. In these situations, you can say, ah, middle school students sometimes look down on their teachers. Makes sense, right? Okay. Here's an example sentence to help you learn how to use this in real life. I've looked down on Timothy ever since I learned he cheated the company. Prior to him cheating the company and stealing money from the company, I valued his opinion. I respected him. But after he cheated the company, I started looking down on him. I don't respect him anymore. Here's another example sentence. Scott has looked down upon me upon is okay upon me ever since the scandal took place last year. Prior to the scandal, Scott valued my opinion, but Scott has looked down upon me ever since the scandal took place last year. Makes sense, right? Good. Here's another example sentence. His fans look down on him now that they've learned it's all a lie. They respected him, but now they don't. His fans look down on him now that they've learned it's all a lie. Makes sense, right? Again, expression number one that you must know to look down on somebody. Now, the second expression is just as important after me to frown upon something. Ooh, good job again to frown upon something. Excellent. Last time to frown upon something. Great job. Now this just means to have or express an unfavorable opinion of again, to have or express an unfavorable opinion of, for example, I remember when I was in South Korea, right? My teacher, my friends and I, we were all teachers, right? And at the end of the day, we would, you know, close everything out, cut the lights off and we'd leave our Institute and it would be late at night. So I remember walking home, walking back to our apartment and we saw a group of teenage boys, teenagers, maybe 15 or 16, and they were smoking. Now we frown upon teenagers smoking because it's not good for their health and they're too young. So we frown upon that activity. We don't think it's good. And my fellow teacher, my friend, she saw them smoking and she took off running and she chased them yelling at them saying, don't smoke. And she really did run. It was quite funny. But again, because we frown upon teenagers smoking makes sense, right? Again, we don't think it's a favorable thing to do. We have an unfavorable opinion of teenagers smoking. Now check out this example sentence. My building frowns upon smoking indoors. Makes sense. I spoke about teenager smoking, but my building frowns upon smoking indoors. What about this example sentence? These days, most people frown upon not wearing a mask in public. You know, we experienced the COVID pandemic, right? So everyone had to start wearing masks. So, most people these days frown upon not wearing a mask in public. And finally, this example sentence, people have always frowned upon burping out loud, right? It seems a little bit rude. So again, people have always frowned upon, have an unfavorable opinion of burping out loud. Makes sense, right? The second expression again, to frown upon something. Excellent. Now the third expression is very important for you to understand and to know how to use it. The expression is to get away with something again, to get away with something good again after me to get away with something. Woo. Excellent. Last time to get away with something. 
Very good. Now, this just means to escape blame or punishment when you do something wrong. Again, to escape blame or punishment when you do something wrong. I remember when I was a counselor, I worked with some young people. Uh, they call it pathfinders at my church. It's basically Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts for church, right? And we were working with the children and something happened. One of the children actually disrespected one of the counselors. She was an older lady and he disrespected her, but we didn't know for sure if he had done it or not. And his friends were saying he didn't do it. So he was getting away with what he did because no one knew for a fact if it was him or not. He was escaping punishment or blame. Now in the end, he did admit it, but at the beginning, he was getting away with it. Makes sense, right? All right, here we go. Here's an example sentence. The popular kids seem to get away with everything. Again, the popular kids seem to escape blame or punishment. They get away with everything. Second, the youngest sibling gets away with more than the older siblings. I wasn't a bad kid. But yes, this is the belief. The youngest sibling gets away with more than the older siblings. My sister would say that. Here we go. Third, the third sentence is, I can't believe we didn't get away with that. I thought it was a solid plan. All right. We didn't get away with it. I thought it was a solid plan. So again, the third expression is to get away with something. Now we have more expressions, but I want to let you know, I am teaching you expressions used in real life by native English speakers. So if you really want to learn more and start sounding like a native English speaker, I want to help you. I want to be your teacher moving forward. Go to EnglishFluencyPlan.com, www.EnglishFluencyPlan.com or hit the link in the description and you'll learn even more than you're learning right now. So here's the fourth expression. In all honesty, good again, in all honesty, excellent. Last time in all honesty, great job. Now this just means we use it when we're saying something that might be disappointing or upsetting. Like, Hey, in all honesty, like I need to be honest. I know this might not come out right. It might not sound good to you, but I, I need to be honest. So again, it's used when you are saying something that might be disappointing or upsetting. So let's check out some example sentences. Here we go. In all honesty, the real problem was me. In all honesty, it wasn't you. I know we blamed you, but when I thought about it over again, I realized it was me in all honesty. The real problem was me. Makes sense, right? Here we go. Next example sentence in all honesty. I wish it had never happened to begin with. I wish we had never gotten together. I wish the re this relationship right here. I wish it had never started in all honesty. I know this might be uncomfortable for you. I wish it had never happened to begin with. You see what's happening, right? And again, again, this is an expression we use as native English speakers and you want to sound like a native English speaker. Another example, in all honesty, I know you, I know you're not going to want to hear this, but in all honesty, you shouldn't date her. I know you're attracted to her. I know you like being around her, but in all honesty, as your friend, you shouldn't date her. Makes sense, right? Okay, here we go. The final expression, expression number five is to tell the truth. Good. Again, to tell the truth. Excellent. Last time after me to tell the truth. Great job. Now this just means we use it actually to say that one is stating what one really thinks. So we use it. We want to say exactly what we are thinking to tell the truth, to tell you the truth. Both are okay. I want to tell you exactly what I'm thinking. What's on my mind. Here's an example sentence. Here we go. The example sentence that I want you to understand so that you can use it like a native English speaker. I didn't really like the movie to tell you the truth. 
Imagine a situation, you go to the mall, then you go to the movies with your friends and you're watching this movie and your friends are like, man, this movie's amazing. You finish the movie and you walk out of the theater and everyone's like, whoo, that was the best movie I have ever seen. Um, I didn't really like the movie to tell you the truth. You want to give your true heart. You want to tell what you're really thinking. Makes sense, right? Here we go. Another example sentence. To tell the truth, I couldn't hear a word he said. I don't know what he was saying. Even though it looked like I was listening, I don't know what he was talking about. To tell the truth. And finally, here we go. To tell the truth, I was afraid to see him. I, I was honestly afraid to meet my dad. I'd been adopted and then my dad came. Not my story, but I, to tell the truth, I, I was afraid to see him. Makes sense, right? Excellent. All right. So today you learned five new English expressions to help you sound like a native English speaker. Remember, if you want to keep studying with me, all you have to do is go to www.englishfluencyplan.com. The link is in the description. I can't wait to see you. All right. So the very first expression is to talk trash about somebody. I know you're probably wondering, Tiffany, what does talking trash about somebody even me. Well, let me explain talking trash about somebody. It literally means to say insulting things about someone. The best way to understand this is gossiping. You're talking trash about someone. You're saying something about them. That's unkind. You're insulting them. You are gossiping about them or talking about them. In other words, you are talking trash about somebody. Now, let me give you an example sentence. Here we go. I heard from a mutual friend that he's been talking trash about you. He's been talking about you behind your back. He's been gossiping about you behind your back. Again, I heard from a mutual friend that he's been talking trash about you. The easiest way to remember this again, trash is something that's thrown out, something that's not good. It has a negative connotation, right? So when someone is talking trash about you, they are something, they're saying something negative about you, right? Again, we say talking trash about somebody. Now here's another example sentence. Why are you talking trash when he's nothing but kind to everyone. He's been nothing but kind to you, to our friends. Why are you talking about him? Why are you speaking negatively about him? One more time. Why are you talking trash when he's been nothing but kind to everyone? Makes sense, right? Okay. Here's the third example sentence. Stop talking trash. If you can't back up your statement. Now this is something very interesting. This is another use of the same expression, but it's when you are, for example, playing a game. I love basketball, right? And sometimes when you play basketball, you say, listen, I'm better than you. I can beat you in any game, anytime, any day. I know my skills are better than yours. So I, in this example, am talking trash to that person, right? I'm saying that my skills are better than their skills. I'm in essence speaking negatively about them, right? We say talking trash. So again, stop talking trash. If you can't back up or support your statement makes sense, right? So again, the expression is to talk trash about somebody. Now this next expression is also a good one. A one, a one, <laughs> one, the native English speakers also use this one is concrete details, concrete details details. Now concrete details. I want you to repeat after me for pronunciation practice, concrete details. Excellent. Now concrete details. This just means a specific description of a particular item, person, or setting. So concrete details, it just refers to this term, this expression, giving exact information, factual, something that a person can take away and say, Hey, this is truth. For example, let me give you concrete details. My next class will be on this day at this time. 
concrete details, date and time. Again, details that are factual, right? In English, we say concrete details. Now here's an example sentence. I'm going to need concrete details before we detain him. Before we keep him, I need to know the facts. Tell me the concrete details. Give me the concrete details. Makes sense, right? Here we go. Next, we have sentence two. A patient may need to have the research described in concrete detail, all the facts to make his decision. He needs to know exactly what's going on. And finally, sentence three, detectives must have concrete details of the crime to start their investigation. They can't go off of people's opinions or suggestions. They need the facts, the concrete details makes sense, right? Again. So this one is very helpful. Concrete details. Now the third English expression is also one that will help you as you are trying to speak English fluently. This expression is to hint at something again, to hint at something. Let me give you an example before I tell you the meaning. So imagine a little boy right before Christmas day, he's talking to his parents and he says, Hey, mommy and daddy, you look like you're doing well. He said, you know, I was just thinking to myself, man, tomorrow's Christmas and woo, how wonderful it would be to have something that I could ride on outside something that, um, it's kind of electric and I could ride on it. Wow. That would be so wonderful. I know that tomorrow is Christmas. You kind of caught it, right? The little boy is actually trying to give his parents some clues that he wants an electric car, right? The little toy cars kids drive in. He's actually hinting at something. And that just means that he is talking about something in an indirect way. You know, mommy and daddy tomorrow's Christmas. And I would love, you know, something that moves and that's electric. He is hinting at something, speaking about it in an indirect way. Makes sense, right? Okay. Now here's the example sentence. He's been hinting at the possibility of running for mayor. Not saying that I want to be selected, but I could do the job. Well, hinting at the possibility of running for mayor next. My son has been hinting to me about going out for ice cream. Mom, ice cream would be great. Wouldn't it? What do you think mom saying these things over and over again? My son has been hinting to me about going for ice cream or going out for ice cream. And finally, I tried hinting at my interest to Jane, but she's not picking up any signals. I'm trying to speak about them in an indirect way, but she's not catching what I'm saying. Again, in English, we say to hint at something. Now this fourth expression, this fourth English expression will also help you sound more like a native English speaker. The expression is first of all. First of all, now, first of all, this one literally just means before doing anything else at the beginning. So first, I want you to do this first. I want to make this point first, first of all, before doing anything else. So for example, here's an example sentence. First of all, let me ask you something before you make your judgment. Hey, I want to stop you really quickly before you move forward. The first thing I want to do, first of all, let me ask you something again at the beginning. Next, here we go. First of all, I'd like to give you a little background information at the beginning right now, before we do anything else, even for this lesson. First of all, I want to make sure you're able to pronounce the word properly. First after me first. Excellent. You see, normally when I'm teaching vocabulary, I want to make sure you as an English learner can pronounce the word properly, right? First of all, let's go over the pronunciation. You got it. All right. Here's another example sentence. First of all, 
you need to clean the wall before you start painting it. I think that's the best thing to do first clean the wall again in English. We say first of all, before doing anything else at the beginning. Now we have four English expressions that are very helpful, but this fifth, this fifth English expression is also very good. It's to change one's mind. And it just means to adopt a different opinion or plan. Again, in English, we say to change one's mind. Hey, you know, normally I do one podcast episode a week, but you know what? I want to help my students more. So I'm going to actually have two podcast episodes every week. I just changed my mind and actually it's true on my podcast. Speak English with Tiffany. There are two episodes. Now there used to only be one. Now there are two episodes. You can check them out. But again, I changed my mind. I adopted a different opinion or plan. Now here's the first example sentence after showing her the evidence. She changed her mind about him. You know what? Brandon, he's a good guy after seeing the evidence. Now this next sentence is also good. I changed her mind after showing her the reviews of the restaurant. I said, listen, look at the reviews. This restaurant is good. I changed her mind. And finally, the third example sentence after trying to plan a trip, Joe changed his mind due to this week's weather forecast. Joe looked online and noticed that it was going to be extremely cold where he wanted to go. Nope. I'm going to change my plans. He changed his mind. So once again, the fifth expression again, once again, we have change one's mind. All right. The very first English expression is to hit the nail on the head to hit the nail on the head. Now this just means to be exactly right about something again, to be exactly right about something. For example, yesterday, true story. I was helping my niece out with her project. She had a project that she needed to complete for school. And the project involved lots of calculations. So I asked her a few times, Hey baby, can you calculate this? Tell me what this number multiplied by this number is. And my niece was able to give me the exact numbers. So when she gave me the exact correct and right answer, I said, you hit the nail on the head. You got it exactly right. Makes sense. Doesn't it? All right. Let me give you some example sentences. All right. Here's sentence number one right here. Sam hit the nail on the head when he said that the company needs to invest more in marketing. Sam got it exactly right. That's what we need to do again. Sam hit the nail on the head when he said that the company needs to invest more in marketing. Now sentence number two, Mary's analysis was spot on. Her boss said that she really hit the nail on the head. Wow. Mary, that's exactly right. That's exactly what we need to do. Your analysis, you hit the nail on the head with your analysis. You got it. All right. Sentence number three, the coach's comments hit the nail on the head about what the team needs to improve before the next game. The coach made the correct assessment, the correct analysis. He was exactly right. This is what the team needs to do. So one more time, the coach's comments hit the nail on the head about what the team needs to improve before the next game. You got it. All right, now let's move on to the second English expression. The second expression is to give someone the benefit of the doubt again, to give someone the benefit of the doubt. Now this just means to believe someone's statement without proof because you think they deserve to be trusted. Perfect example. I am your English teacher. 
I love helping you achieve each and every one of your English goals. And you've probably been with me for a while, or if it's your first time, welcome. So happy to be your English teacher now. But now you started to trust me, right? You've watched multiple English lessons from other English teachers and they are amazing. And maybe they help you with other parts of the English language. And then you come to my English lessons and you're like, man, I like teacher Tiffany. I like her lessons so much so that when I come out with a new lesson, you automatically give me the benefit of the doubt. You automatically trust what I am teaching you because of my past lessons, because of how my past lessons helped you improve your English. You give me the benefit of the doubt. Oh, I see it. Yes. Again, to believe someone's statement without proof. You believe what I'm teaching you. You haven't went to Google to check if this is the exact definition, but you believe what I'm teaching you because of my past English lessons. You think that I deserve to be trusted. In other words, you give me the benefit of the doubt. That makes sense. Doesn't it? Good. You're so smart. All right. Here's the first example sentence. Even though I didn't see him do it. I'll give Michael the benefit of the doubt and assume he didn't steal her wallet. I'll trust him. I don't have any proof, but I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Good. Now this honestly is an expression that native English speakers use on a regular basis. And when you start using it, man, Americans, even British people, people that speak English as their native language will be impressed with your English. So please start using it. Here's the other example sentence. Michelle was late for the meeting, but I'll give her the benefit of the doubt and assume she had a good reason. Michelle was late for the meeting, but Hey, I'll give her the benefit of the doubt and assume she had a good reason. The third example sentence, the teacher gave the students the benefit of the doubt and didn't punish them for not having their homework. All right, guys, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and I won't punish you for not having your homework ready. Makes sense, right? In English, once again, we say, give someone the benefit of the doubt. All right. Makes sense. Good. Let's move on to expression. Number three, another good one to be on the same page, to be on the same page. Now this just means to have the same understanding or agreement about something to have the same understanding or agreement about something. Now the students that uh, follow me, so I have an Academy again, you're welcome to join. All you have to do. Let me show you very quickly. If you're watching this video, if you'd like to join my Academy and be a part of our family, all you have to do is go to www.dailyenglishlessons.com www.dailyenglishlessons.com. Now the students that are with me, part of our family, they hear me say this all the time. Are we on the same page? Does everyone understand so much so that now our family members, the other students in the Academy use it so naturally. Again, it just means to understand, to be in agreement. Hey, we're on the same page. We are thinking in the same way. In English, we say we are on the same page, a very commonly used expression. So here are some example sentences. Here we go. Sentence number one, we need to make sure everyone is on the same page before we start the next project. Makes sense. You got it. Here we go. Sentence number two, the finance team had a meeting to discuss their goals and make sure they were all on the same page. Are we all agreeing on this? Do we all believe the same thing? Are we all? on the same page. And now sentence number three, the couple had a disagreement yesterday, but now they are on the same page about the future of their relationship. Yesterday they weren't agreeing, but now, Hey, they agree. They are on the same page. You got it. Excellent. Excellent. Now the fourth expression is really a good one as well to have 
a change of heart. Once again, to have a change of heart. Now this just means to change one's mind or opinion about something to change one's mind or opinion about something. I remember when I went to South Korea and I've told this story before during story time. Hey, don't worry. Story time is coming at the end. So don't go anywhere. But when I first went to South Korea, I had what is known as the pokey. A poke is basically a rice cake that they make and it's a certain shape and they put this sweet, spicy sauce on it. But when I first went to Korea, I didn't like it. It didn't match my taste buds. It was something new, but I eventually had a change of heart. Now I love it. By the time I finished my 10 years in Korea, I loved it. I had a change of heart. My taste buds changed. I started to desire it more again to change one's mind or opinion about something in the beginning. It wasn't delicious to me. Now it is delicious. Makes sense, right? To have a change of heart. Here's the first example sentence. The first time I went to the new restaurant, I didn't like it, but after trying it again, I had a change of heart. I realized, oh, ho, 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 this food is good. I had a change of heart. Now here's sentence number two. The young politician had a change of heart about his stance on climate change after seeing the effects firsthand. He saw what climate change was doing. He had a change of heart. He changed his mind. And finally, the customer had a change of heart and decided to buy the more expensive purse. Initially she was going to buy the cheaper purse, but she decided to purchase the expensive one. She had a change of heart. Make sense. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Now expression number five, another important one to be in the same boat, to be in the same boat. Now this just means to be in the same difficult situation as someone else to be in the same difficult situation. We're both struggling. We're both having a hard time. For example, I remember when I was back in college having to prepare for a final exam, a difficult exam, studying late into the night, waking up early to review, but myself and my other classmates, we were in the same boat. We were all struggling to study, to make sure we passed the exam. We were in the same boat again, to be in the same difficult situation as someone else. Make sense. You got it. You got it. Here's an example sentence. Number one, it is important to remember that we're all in the same boat. We're all experiencing the same difficulties. We're all in the same boat. Next sentence. Number two, the employees were all worried about losing their jobs. So they were in the same boat. You caught it, right? Excellent. And finally, the passengers on the delayed flight were all in the same boat. They were all going to be late for their next flight or to get to their next destination. They were all in the same boat. Make sense. All right. Excellent. Number one, cut to the chase, cut to the chase after me, cut to the chase. Excellent. Now this just means to get to the main point or important information quickly and directly, just like I did with this lesson. I said who I was. I said what I was going to teach you and we jumped right in. We cut to the chase. You got it right. Excellent. Excellent. Now here's an example sentence that will help you understand how to use this expression in real life. Here we go. Can you please cut to the chase and tell me what happened exactly? Can you please get to the main point? Tell me the most important information. Tell me what happened exactly. You got it. 
<laughs> Excellent. Here's the second example sentence. Let's cut to the chase and discuss more important issues. Let's discuss the most important issues. You see again, directly getting to the most important information. Once again, let's cut to the chase and discuss the most important issues. You got it. Good. Here's the next one. I don't have much time. So can you cut to the chase and give me the key points? Hey, I'm a little busy. So can you just give me the main point or the most important information? Can you cut to the chase? You got it. Excellent. Excellent. So again, this is the first English expression that you must master cut to the chase. Now, one thing I want to let you know is that after you learn these expressions, you need to practice using them. So what I've done for you is in my app, that's right. The English with Tiffany app, you can download it right now. All you have to do is click the link in the description. When you download the app and open it, you'll see weekly English fluency lessons with teacher Tiffany. These lessons are connected to my YouTube lessons. So you can go right to the app after this lesson and practice what you are learning. You'll even find the video within the app. This is going to help you so much because as you're learning, you need to also practice. So you'll find tons of practice lessons connected to this lesson that will help you master these expressions. So once again, download the app by clicking the link in the description, English with Tiffany. You got it. All right, let's keep going to number two. All right. Expression number two, keep someone in the loop. Keep someone in the loop after me, keep someone in the loop. Excellent. Now this just means to inform someone and keep them updated about a situation or project. Hey, this person might've missed the meeting or, Hey, this person might not have heard the new information. Don't worry. I'll tell them. Don't worry. I'll give them the information. I will keep them in the loop once again to inform someone and keep them updated about a situation or project makes sense, right? Hey, I heard that there's going to be a birthday party for Samantha. Please keep me in the loop as new information about the party comes up. Please keep me up to date. Keep me in the loop. You got it. All right, good. Here's an example sentence. Please keep me in the loop about any changes to the new schedule. Please keep me in the loop about any changes to the new schedule. Next we have sentence two. It's important to keep everyone in the loop so that we're all on the same page. We all are aware of the same information. We're all moving in the same direction. It's important to keep everyone in the loop so that we're all on the same page. You got it. Good. Here we go. Finally, I'll keep you in the loop as we make progress on the project. One more time. I'll keep you in the loop as we make progress on the project. You got it. Excellent. So again, expression number two that you need to master and practice after this lesson using the app is keep someone in the loop. All right. Expression number three that you need to master is break the ice, break the ice. All right. Break the ice. Now this is something that is also very important. Break the ice after me, break the ice. Very good. Now this just means to initiate a conversation or interaction in order to make people feel more comfortable. Once again, to initiate a conversation or interaction in order to make people feel more comfortable. So I'm your English teacher, right? I love helping you speak English fluently. I love helping you learn new words, expressions, and different ways to think in English. 
But when I worked in South Korea, I was more of an in-person teacher, not virtual, right? And I remember the first day of class was always the most uncomfortable for students at the beginning. They'd walk into class, not knowing each other. They'd sit down, they'd have their books open or they'd have their cell phones and they'd kind of be scrolling through their cell phones. One would come in two, three, four, 10, 15 students sitting in class quietly. At that moment, I knew I had to break the ice to make the students feel comfortable. So usually on the first day, we'd have some, so some sort of activity to make the students feel more comfortable. I had to break the ice, initiating conversations or initiating activities. Make sense? All right, good. Here's the first example sentence. Let's break the ice and introduce ourselves. You got it? All right, here we go. The second one. I always find it hard to break the ice with new people. It's a little bit challenging, a little bit tricky. And finally, he told a joke to break the ice and lighten the mood. Everyone was a little bit nervous or uncomfortable in the environment until he broke the ice by telling the joke. Make sense? All right, excellent. So again, break the ice. Now it's time to practice after this lesson, all right? Expression number four, get the hang of, get the hang of after me, get the hang of excellent. Now stay till the end because for story time, I'm going to tell you a story using this expression and talking about my niece. All right. So here we go. Don't miss the story. The meaning of this expression to understand or become familiar with something again, to understand or become familiar with something. For example, I know how to play tennis, right? I learned back when I was in college and you know, it's kind of an easy game to learn how to play. Right. But I learned the rules when I was in college, but my friend, maybe about four, maybe three years ago, told me about a game called pickleball. Maybe you've heard of it, pickleball. And it uses a racket that kind of looks like a ping pong paddle and a tennis paddle had a baby. It's a smaller paddle than a tennis racket, but it's not as small as a ping pong paddle, but the shape. So anyways, he was explaining to me how to play pickleball the different rules and how to use the paddle. After a while, I got the hang of it. It started making sense. I was able to understand. You got it? Excellent. I got the hang of pickleball. All right, so here's the first example sentence. It took me a while to get the hang of using this new computer. It took me a while, but I got it. Next. Once you get the hang of it, this game is really fun. You got it. And finally, she's still trying to get the hang of driving an electric car. You got it. Excellent. In English, we say, get the hang of again, master this expression so that you can sound like a native English speaker. And now we have English expression number five. Get a taste of your own medicine after me, get a taste of your own medicine. Good. Excellent. Now this just means to experience the same negative treatment or behavior that one has given to others. Once again, to experience the same negative treatment or behavior that one has given to others. So imagine you're at a store and the cashier, you walk up to pay for your item, but the cashier is extremely rude, extremely unkind, snatching your money and not looking at you in the eye. Very rude. You walk away and five minutes later, that same cashier is called to the back. Her boss says, oh, 
You want to be rude to customers and the boss proceeds to treat her in a way that blows her mind in a bad way. Cursing at her, speaking negatively to her, disrespecting her, being rude to her. She's getting a taste of her own medicine. A very extreme case of being rude to people and then someone else being rude to you. You're feeling the exact same feeling that others felt when you did it to them. Makes sense, right? Get a taste of your own medicine. And this is always used for negative things. So here are some example sentences. After years of being rude to her coworkers, she finally got a taste of her own medicine. Similar to the example I gave, right? Check out this other example sentence. He's always been a bully. But now that he's on the receiving end, he's getting a taste of his own medicine. Someone else is bullying him. And finally, the company's unethical practices came back to haunt them when they got a taste of their own medicine. Makes sense, right? Again, getting a taste of your own medicine. You've done something negative to someone and now that same thing is being done to you. In English, we say, get a taste of your own medicine. What's up? What's good? How you living in today's English lesson, I am going to teach you English slang that starts with the letter F. Instead of saying hello, I used some slang terms and I want to help you understand English slang so that you won't be lost and so that you can start using them too. You ready? Well then, I'm teacher Tiffany. Let's jump right in. Number one, slang starting with the letter F. The first one is flex. Good. Again, after me, flex. Nice. Last time, flex. Excellent. Now, flex, it just means to show off or boast about one's achievements, possessions, or skills. To boast about these things. So let's say, for example, I have an iPad. Now, I use this iPad for work to help me teach you English better. But I want you to imagine I got the first iPad that came out this year. Brand new iPad. Woo! Looking good. And I go up to my friend. I wouldn't do this, but just as an example, and I say, you know, I got the new iPad. I mean, it's the top of the line. It's amazing. It's new. I'm flexing. <laughs> you caught it, right? Again, flexing just means you're boasting about your possessions, your skills, or your achievements, making it seem like you are better than other people. You got it? Now, you know, I'm not like that, but to understand the term, I had to show you a little bit. So number one, we have flex. Now, what about the second slang term again, that starts with the letter F. The second one is fire. Good again, fire. Excellent. Now this just means we use it when we're trying to describe something as excellent, amazing, or highly impressive. For example, true. I would like another car. My dream car right now is a Lexus IS sporty while at the same time being a four door car. The car is fire. Whenever I see it driving on the highway, I turn my head to follow it down the road. Why? Because the car is amazing. The car is impressive. The car is fire. You got it, right? Yes, this slang term is extremely useful. Again, in English, we say fire. Maybe you have a car that in your opinion is also fire. All right, here we go. The next one, number three, the third slang term is fam. Yeah, you're probably guessing what it means. I hid it from you this time. 
Again, fam. Excellent. Last time after me, fam. Great job. So what does this mean when we say fam? It is short for the word family, but it refers to family or close friends. And it's used to refer to a group of people you are close with. For example, some of the friends I made while living in South Korea have become, become more like family. So I can say, Hey, what's good fam? How you doing fam? They're not related to me by blood, but they're so close to me. I feel like they're family. I can say, what's going on fam? How you been fam? So if someone says, Hey fam, how are you? They feel close to you. Make sense. Excellent. All right. So the third slang term we have is fam. Now let's go to number four. The fourth one, again, using the letter F the fourth one is flaky. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you've heard this one again, flaky. Excellent. Last time after me flaky. Great job. Now, what does this slang term flaky actually mean? Because bread can be flaky. What does flaky mean? It means someone who is unreliable, often canceling plans or not following through on commitments. Let me, let me describe it like this group of friends. You call one friend. Hey, uh, Barbara, Girl, this weekend, we are going to hang out. We're going to meet Saturday night at 8 PM. Barbara, can you come girl? Yes, I'll be there. Barbara says, yes, I will be there. Saturday rolls around 7 30 PM. Everyone's leaving their homes to head out to meet at the restaurant. Everyone's like, Hey y'all, we'll be there. See you soon. Barbara. Oh guys, I'm so sorry. I don't think I'll be able to make it. Everyone in the group. Okay. Barbara, why they're not surprised. Barbara is very flaky. She'll say that she'll do something. She'll say that she'll be somewhere and then she won't come. Barbara is very flaky, unreliable. You caught it. Excellent. All right. So flaky, don't be flaky. Flaky is not a good thing to be. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's move on to number five. What is number five? Again, using the letter F we have this slang term faded. Good. Again, after me faded. Excellent. Last time after me faded. Great job. Now you might've heard this term used in a movie or a television program. Why? Because it literally means to be intoxicated, drunk, or under the influence of drugs or alcohol. I want you to think about a television program you've seen, or maybe a movie you've seen where the character or characters were drinking a lot of alcohol or doing drugs. And after they did the drugs or drank the alcohol, suddenly, I mean, their eyes kind of glazed over. They kind of were sitting back in their seats or they just weren't all there. They weren't able to speak coherently. They weren't able to understand what was happening in those situations. You can say, ah, they're faded, intoxicated or under the influence makes sense, right? Excellent. Again, the real reason why I try to teach you these slang terms is so that when you watch programs, when you hear conversations between native English speakers or in person, or maybe online, you won't be confused. I got you. I care about you. All right. So we're going to move on to number six, but before we go to number six, I want to remind you, remember I have an app and this app, I want to put it on the screen for you. English with Tiffany. After each lesson, you can practice what you are learning. You can quiz yourself. You can have fun rehearsing and reviewing what I am teaching you in the lesson. So if you don't already have the app, click the link in the description or go to your phone and download the English with Tiffany app and start practicing what you learn in each of my English lessons. All right. So 
Don't forget to download the app and practice after this lesson. Let's move on to number six. Number six, starting with the letter F again, we have face plant. Good. Again, after me, face plant. Excellent. Last time after me, face plant. Great job. So what does this mean? Face plant. Here's the definition of face plant to fall forward and land face first on the ground face plant. Let's say you go somewhere with your friends and you're all running, right? You're running together and you trip. Oh no. Bow. Sorry if that was loud for you, but you hit your face. Uh Oh, face planted. That is a slang term. It means face plant. You literally hit the ground and your face hit the ground as well. In English, we say face plant. Make sense. All right, good. Let's keep it moving. Here we go. Let's move on to number seven. Number six was a little bit easier to understand because it's kind of literal. Number seven flop. Good again after me flop. Excellent. Last time after me flop. Great job. Now this just means when you're describing something that is a complete failure or disappointment, you use the term flop. We tried to start a business. We put so much money into the business. We bought a building, we hired people, but it failed. It completely flopped again, failure or disappointment. I flopped. I thought I was going to do well, but I failed. It was a complete flop. Make sense. Again, you're going to hear these terms when you're looking at videos on Instagram or TikTok or watching a video on Netflix or YouTube, or even a movie on regular TV. Now you'll know what these terms actually mean. Let's go on to number eight. Number eight, again, starting with the letter F, what does this slang term mean after me? Fierce. Good. I guarantee you'll hear this on social media again after me fears. Excellent. Last time after me fears. Great job. Now this literally is used to describe someone or something as bold, intense, or powerful. For example, many people say Beyonce is fierce, bold, powerful, intense. Someone that demands or commands respect. They walk into a room. Wow. Wow. Or someone walks into a room. Normally we say fierce when we're speaking about a female, about a woman, right? Walks into the room, great outfit, hair done, makeup looking good. Okay, girl, you are fierce, intense, powerful. You got it. All right. Excellent. Okay. Let's move on to number nine. Again, slang terms, starting with the a letter F we have flexing. Good, good. <laughs> you got it right again. Flexing. Excellent. We're going to stop there. Why? Because number one was what? Do you remember? Flex. Flexing and flex. Same meaning. But I wanted to make sure you understood someone might use it in this way. Okay. You trying to flex on me. That's number one or number two. I see you flexing. I see you flexing. You see same meaning, but different form of the word. So again, similar to flex, but often used to describe someone who is showing off or pretending to be something they're not. Oh, you flexing. That's not your car. For example, pull up in a Lamborghini. Yeah. You guys like my car. Yeah. You flexing. That's not your car. You're trying to act like it is, but it's not. You caught it. Excellent. So again, we say flexing, stop flexing. All right. And number 10, the 10th slang term using the letter F fronting. Yes. Do not say fronting. We don't say fronting. Remember this is slang after me fronting. Good. Last time after me fronting. Excellent. Now this just means 
Similar to pretending or acting, it's used to describe someone who is putting up a false front or trying to deceive others. Again, going back to the other example I used, someone driving a Lamborghini, now they're driving a Jaguar. They're acting like they own the Jaguar when actually it belongs to their friend. It's not theirs. They pull up. Y'all like my new car? No, stop fronting. That's not yours. Stop acting like it's yours. Stop fronting. You caught it? Excellent. All right. Now these slang terms, again, they will help you understand TV, social media, and so many other things. And you also can use them too. Not in a professional setting, but with your friends. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I hope you start using these terms. And don't forget, I will see you in the next lesson. You still there? <laughs> you know what time it is. It's story time. Hey, I said it's story time. One more time. I said it's story time. Hey, I said it's story time. All right. Now this one, this is a good one. This is a good one. So two weeks ago, about no, a week ago, I had a class with my students, right? Again, I have students in my program. If you want to join us, come join our family, please. All you have to do is go to dailyenglishlessons.com. So anyways, we were having our monthly meeting. And in our monthly meeting, I happened to bring up a slang term. The slang term was referring to the other teacher, teacher Carly, an amazing teacher. She and I were chit chatting, right? But I naturally said, oh yeah, we were chit chatting it up. And I said, like, wait a minute, this is a slang term that the students have not heard before. So I brought everyone back to the main room. We were on Zoom and I said, okay, everyone, I'm going to teach you a slang term. This expression is a little bit long, so just follow me. And I started slow. I said, chit chatting it up. All right, four words, chit chatting it up. We started slow, right? And I said, in the end, the purpose is for you to be able to say it like this, chit-chatting it up. Oh, we're just chit-chatting it up very quickly. It just means to basically shoot the breeze, just talking to each other, right? So I was going through and explaining it, and I realized it was kind of a tongue twister. I realized that I had to pick a different method to help the students be able to say it. So I said, all right, guys, this is what I want you to do. Think about rhythm. I have students from all over the world, right? I said, listen, guys, don't focus on the words, focus on the sound and the rhythm. They said, okay, teacher, what do you mean? I said, all right, guys, chit chatting it up, chit chatting it up, chit chatting it up. And as soon as I started uh, snapping my fingers and moving my body, I could see everyone, different cultures, different countries. They said, okay, tip, chit chatting it up chit chatting it up and they were getting it. So we were all smiling like, okay, listen, music helps, rhythm helps. And there was one student and I could see on her face. She said, mm -mm, nope, 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 literally. So I'm looking at everyone. I said, okay, everybody stop, everyone stop. So let's say her name was Samantha. I won't call her out. Let's say her name was Samantha. I said, Samantha, I see you. She said, oh no. I said, it's okay. I'm gonna call you out. Samantha, let me know what's wrong. She said, Tiffany, I can't do it. I said, yes, you can. I said, Samantha, listen, follow me, follow me, snap with me, chit-chatting it up, chit-chatting it up, chit-chatting it up. And so slowly but surely, she was getting it. She said, okay, Tiff, I can try. I said, now follow me again, chit-chatting it up. And she did it. So we're all like, yeah, Samantha, you did it, you did it. She said, Tiff, but there's one problem. I said, what, Samantha? She said, I can't sing. I said, but baby girl, you're wrapped today. <laughs> she burst out laughing. I said, well, listen, you just wrapped today. Chit chatting it up. As long as you can follow the rhythm and the beat, you can say it. So we all got a good laugh. And I think that's something the students that attended that class will never forget. And I want to remind you as well, if there's ever something difficult to say, you're trying to follow the intonation, it's too quick or it's too long. Think about it like a song. Think about the sounds instead of the words, and it will change your life. Hope you enjoyed this story, and I'll talk to you in the next lesson.